are part of the Digital Building Week series of online events. I'm Chloe McCulloch, Buildings Editor, and this webinar, An Introduction to Smart Buildings and Cybersecurity, New Guidance and Best Practice on the Security of Smart Built Environments, IOTSF. Now that's quite a mouthful <laughs> to get out in one go. Um, but I just want to explain for those who don't know that IOTSF stands for Internet of Things Security Foundation, and that foundation promotes IT security. Our speakers today are going to explain much more about that. Um, so just to introduce them, we have uh, Jason Shaw, Associate Security Consultant at Hilsa Moran, and we have James Williamson, founder of uh, Unified Security. Um, you cannot see James, unfortunately, because his webcam is not allowing us access, um, but you can see Jason, um, and both of them are on this call. So you will hear more from them in a moment. Um, so basically they will be going through new guidance, best practice, recommendations around security for smart buildings, for owners and facility, uh, facilities management professionals and manufacturers as well. Um, so just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, a reminder that uh, our audience is very welcome to post questions and our, um, our two panelists will be able to answer those at the end. But if, if a question comes to mind, springs to mind, please just post it and I will be looking at those and saving them up for um, the Q&A session at the end. Um, so please do post a question. Um, and finally, this webinar will be available on demand. So if you've missed the start or missed a little bit of it, you can get it um, again uh, available on demand from our website. And if um, it strikes you that a colleague might be interested, um, you can let them know and they just need to register. So I think that's probably it from me. I am going to hand over um, initially to uh, James and uh, Jason, if you want to turn off your webcam and uh, probably keep on your mic just so that um, between the two of you, you can work out which slide you're on because uh, uh, James might not be able to see. Okay. Over to you guys. Well, hello everyone, welcome and thank you for joining us. Um, I'm James Willison, I'm co-chair of the Smart Built Environment Working Group for the IoT Security Foundation. And yes, it's a quite a long title, but the idea is that we are looking at smart built environments. That doesn't just mean buildings, it means uh, factories, warehouses, anything that's connected to the internet, basically. And so we're looking at trying to make sure that those connections are secure. And the reason why, why we're doing this is that it's now becoming a growing concern. And we'll, we'll explore that a bit later. I'm joined by my colleague, Jason Shaw, and we are both working on facilities and other environments, and also presently on buildings in, in the City of London. So we, we have got some first-hand experience on, on these particular issues, and it's not just, just theory. So if that's the next slide, please, please, Jason. So yes, the IoT Security Foundation, we are here to make it safe to connect. That's our purpose, that's why we're here, and uh, the two of us are representing the foundation today. Next slide shows the history of um, the, the foundation and why it took place. Well, you can see all those attacks, and that's why we're concerned, and so many other people are. So we can't carry on like this. Something needs to be done to protect users. And the cyber criminals can hack refrigerators. Chrysler had an issue a few years back. There's also the problem of um, diabetic patients there. Uh, medical device security, that's something we're looking at at our conference in November, which we welcome you to November the 3rd to the 4th. Again, we've got here, we started in 2015, and the next slide shows, thank you, Jason, to um, September the 23rd, 2015, in response to wide-ranging security concerns, we formed the foundation. The next slide shows that we are, our purpose is to make it safe to connect. So 
that's really where we're striving to get to with businesses, enterprises, and, and how are we going to achieve this? So that the idea is that we enable IoT markets by driving both quality and ubiquity of fit-for-purpose security solutions through adoption of an industry best practice. And you might say, well, what best practice? Uh, that's all very nice to say. And well, actually, we've together with our membership, which is 150 members, the next slide shows us that um, we have a good selection of members from large enterprises to small businesses, small companies uh, producing uh, IoT security software to help you in your in your environment and also we've got the big players cisco tuv uh bt obviously and signify um they're they're huge companies so we can draw on some of the people from those to help us understand what exactly are the iot security risks in your building uh, moving on to the next slide now, this is the compliance framework, and I, I wanted to explain this because it's a free download. You can go onto our website, and you can see all the different things that it covers there, business security processes, device hardware and physical security, device operating systems, encryption and key management, web face interface, web user interface, privacy, that's a big one there. So we're looking at all the major concerns that would be of cybersecurity relevance, but in this case, it's on an operational and IoT environment. So that's your lighting, your heating, your building management systems, all those different things in a building that are not really traditionally looked at by cybersecurity professionals. They tend to be actually in the domain of the physical security and facilities management, and that's where the problems are occurring because the relationships aren't being formed between facilities managers and um, cybersecurity professionals who might be able to help them. Our next slide shows that we have also produced best practice guidance on all the, on those areas. The slide after that is one of my favourites because it's got "Can you trust your smart building?" white paper, which we produced in 2019. And of course, trust is a big issue, which we'll look at a bit later. The next slide is the fact that the foundation. It's not a small company, so it's a non-for-profit organization, but it's also now very well regarded by NIST, which is the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the US, and also Etsy in Europe, where they have um, successfully uh, deployed our, some of our framework that I've just referred to uh, in their guidance on, on IoT security. Um, the next slide. Um, now this is why we're here today, Toronto Sidewalk Labs. Uh, so you might say, so what's that? And um, what's, so why are we here? What, what, what's going? Well, basically, Toronto Sidewalks project cancelled. So Toronto Sidewalks is a project with Google and Toronto Sidewalks La Sidewalk Labs, where they were constructing um, lots of smart buildings um, areas on the sidewalk in Toronto. And they didn't consult with the Canadian residents of Toronto. They just launched into doing this without really negotiating with anyone else. And the, the downside of that was that um, their residents complained and they went to court and managed to stop the construction going on, which is why I'm making the point. And the next slide, please. Um, it's called the Canadian Civil Liberties Association called for it to be reset basically because they weren't following digital data governance on the collection of residents' data and sharing this, and they were sharing this with third parties such as Google's affiliate sidewalks. And the, the, the residents argued that this was unconstitutional, and they won. So residents and people in the area, the way you're building um, these uh, environments, can complain, they have a right to complain, and if they're not involved at the outset, then we have to be careful that uh, privacy concerns are not um, going to completely end your plans to build that building. Uh, so you have to involve people where you can. And it's their right for privacy if we talk a bit later. The city of Baltimore, next slide, is um, they are looking um, in 2019, you may have noticed that 
a couple of weeks, they couldn't operate their well, their emails, lots of their servers were down, and they were hit by an aggressive ransomware called Robin Hood. And um, it's a good name, I suppose, but all, all servers, with the exception of essential services, were taken offline. And they decided that, following government advice, that they shouldn't pay the ransom. And um, the ransom was only $76,000, but it cost them $18.2 million to put everything back um, in their own way, rather than uh, asking the hackers to help them. So the hackers can, as it says, purposely keep the ransom demands lower than it would cost to recover the systems, which obviously that is, um, and making the, paying the ransom seem a bit of a better economic choice for underfunded local governments. Uh, and some other cities have paid the ransom and have and noticeably colonial in uh, the, this year, they paid the ransom, three or four million dollars, uh, and to get the pipeline working back in the east coast of the Amer of America. And again, that's another reason why we should be looking at securing the systems. And it might not seem obvious that a pipeline is a smart environment, but it is connected to lots mm -hmm. of different systems, and your IoT could be a weak entrance. So your your heating in your system, in your building could be a vector of attack for for a hacker to get in there into your building. Um, the next slide shows you that the NCSC, that's the National Security, that's the National Cyber Security Centre, they, they have um, put together a very useful document called Connected Places, which has come out this year in I think it was May June time, and they defined as a uh, connected place as um, as a connect well basically um, connecting to to the internet and uh, it basically says if if connected systems are compromised the consequences could impact the local citizens impacts could range from breaches of privacy which I explained earlier to the disruption of failure of critical functions which I explained just before with a pipeline. This, this could mean destructive impacts, which it certainly can, in some cases could endanger the local citizens, either physically or you know, financially, or they can't get the petrol or whatever it is. So there could also be impacts to the local authorities, as we saw in um, Baltimore, that are attacked. These could include a loss of reputation that could affect citizen participation. We also saw this in Bristol with the police and their use of um, uh, uh, ID and uh, AI and uh, biometric identification of people, um, not just surveillance, but getting more. Um, and that was overturned in, in court as well. So when you're using these technologies, these IoT technologies, advanced technologies, which are uh, monitoring people and they're affecting their privacy, that's where we have uh, for issues of trust. And there's a um, link there um, for that connected places, which of course is um, uh, recommended best practice from the government. So obviously the government's now taking this seriously, and that means um, some of us here should be as well. Uh, moving on to the next slide, please. Uh, Okay, so what is, what is our response? And we decided to hold a workshop in January 2020. We got together four main stakeholders, which were the building owners, the manufacturers, the facilities management professionals, and the installers. And we looked together at what are the challenges to securing IoT devices and systems in a smart building. And we looked at the next slide. We had bi-weekly calls in February, we meet, we still meet together regularly to discuss this and each bringing a comprehensive guidance and best practices, which we'll look at. Next slide is our review process. We regularly review and update the documents and they're due out next, next year in Q1. We're still aligning them and refining them to make sure that they are uh, targeting the audiences such as building owners, facilities managers and manufacturers. So. Uh, we're writing, uh, re revising it as we speak. We have two documents of over 20,000 words and one at 13,000 words. 
and another one at 8,000 as well. Today, on um, the next slide, we'll highlight the value of the content and how it complements it, what makes it relevant to particular stakeholders, as I just described earlier. Next slide is um, smart buildings. Okay, so um, a smart building, this is uh, one of my colleagues and my co-chairs, uh, Saab Sembi from Virtually Informed. Saab has done a lot of work on, on the definition of smart buildings, and we're thankful to him and um, his, his development of that definition. And he's come up with this, and it's drawn on lots of other people's um, definitions of smart buildings, obviously. But he's tried to sum up the key points here. And so thank you to Saab. Um, the first one, the key components making up the environment are that it utilizes several technology systems, including sensors, that collects and shares data via a network, it uses a unified management system, uh, which we might look at later, it takes actions or it makes decisions, so it's intelligent, and it provides benefits to various stakeholders. Now you might not think that's all new, but we've, we're trying to highlight the key, the key dimensions of what's smart. And unfortunately, that means a lot of buildings aren't really smart. Well, <laughs> so, and a famous person in South Korea looked at a Korean smart city, and he said basically it isn't. <laughs> and that's someone who knows what, <laughs> about it. And um, because in the end, these systems aren't really that smart. So um, before I hand over to Jason, um, we have um, the next slide. We're talking about the, the building working groups. And uh, there might be an opportunity for a quick break here. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much there, James. Um, just while we bring up the next slide, do we just want to have the next slide of building working groups up while we just uh, have a quick moment? I just wanted to, um, that, that was fascinating and also slightly terrifying. Mm. <laughs> you, don't mind um, there's, a, there's a lot to go, uh, sorry, I'll just put my webcam on while I, while I speak. Um, so there, there's a lot in there. Um, We've got one question in already, and I would just um, encourage um, listeners to post your questions um, to James and Jason, and, and we will get to them. But actually, I'll, I'll bring this question up in, in now because it kind of coincides with something I was thinking. Um, he asks, uh, so we've got um, Godfried asks, uh, some governments are considering prohibiting paying ransoms. Do you believe that would help enforcing organisations to improve security and resilience and that that made me i was also thinking well what what sort of obligations are there to actually treat security as seriously as we clearly should be um is, is this something that you you think might be being considered prohibiting paying ransomware at least in the uk yes of course the us um, recently have been discussing it with colonial pipeline and saying that the official guidance is not to pay and of course they did pay. And that's been ongoing in, in their Congress. I'm not sure what the result of it right now is, but they certainly had to explain why they did it. And the guidance, is, as, as Godfrey explains, is um, you shouldn't pay. But of course, that, that, well, I'll give the example of Baltimore, they didn't pay, but they've ended up paying 18 million high cost. And as, as he points out, it's probably because they're not they're not investing in cybersecurity of these systems. That's one of the reasons. Uh, because that, if they did, if there has more investment in IoT security, then there's less likelihood that it's going to be impacting. And so the same with cameras, because a lot of people they don't think CCTV cameras are IoT, or Internet of Things, but actually they are. So they are sort of mini, I say computers, but they're, they have devices that have got sensors of watching you, and then, um, but they aren't necessarily secure, as Matt Hancock fortunately, unfortunately found out for him. Well, yeah. You know, so, <laughs> but that's the case in point, isn't it? Um, that, that's an IoT device, and that, that camera was not secure. And I'm sure he's not a very happy man. Yeah. But that's and, how and, it is. And it's happening, yes, like you say, in the heart of government. So, yeah. you do. Um, and you do happen to have better that are more secure. 
yeah yeah work. no it's it's very serious clearly well look i i will encourage um listeners to keep posting questions that was a good one from godfrey so thank you um and we we're going to move on to the next set of um well the same set of slides but we're we're moving on to jason um so i'm just going to get rid of my webcam and it's over to you jason thank you chloe so um so what is it about smart built environment then what is it that um it, it brings to us i suppose well it, it has many benefits um i guess one of the primary benefits is it reduces energy consumption by using intelligent smart systems um it, it improves productivity for building users um but also it presents a unique set of risks and um if you think about it uh, a cyber incident that that potentially impacts building operations for a smart building um, is not really a very sustainable building. So it's important that we do consider cyber security. So as James um, touched on earlier, there were we we hope there be four working groups. At the moment, there are three. Um, they're all very advanced. The documentation is, is sort of going through the final um, proofing stages and they will be um, published early next year. And essentially, the property and facility managers documents um, have some synergy. Um, they kind of come from slightly different angles in that property managers um, or building owners um, are, are those that typically ask for the smart buildings or smart um, smart buildings within the built environment i suppose um, so um, people like myself are involved in designing smart systems before the building's built um, but also on the other side facility managers quite often are given a building to manage and they then have to pick up and run with whatever that building um, sorry it moved on by itself um, they have to run with whatever building systems are within that that building already mm -hmm. Um, so the the um, documentation, the guidance that we've produced um, really assists in identifying um, the building systems that you have, um, the risk management side to how you can manage those risks, means of mitigating risks, but also touching on things like supply chain. Obviously, smart building has very heavy reliance on um, third party suppliers. Um, and also the documents provide recommendations and further sources for guidance. In terms of the manufacturer's do um, guidance document, that really sort of talks around best practice of developing and manufacturing secure IoT um, devices and hardware. So what are some of the challenges? <clears throat> so um, if, we, if we think about cybersecurity, when should we think about it? At what stage? of the development of a building, should we think about cybersecurity? Well, as early as possible. Um, if you design a building with devices that are not secure, um, and then it's found that there are, there are vulnerabilities that potentially could impact the security posture of your building, it's not easy to change that. The, you can't just go and rip and replace systems. So it's important really that cybersecurity is thought about early on really at the, the sort of um, conceptual stage really of the building. Um, some of the other challenges I've just touched on was supply chain. So the smart building is very reliant on third party suppliers, whether that's suppliers of systems, whether that's maintain, uh, maintenance of systems, um, but very, very uh, supply chain um, uh, focus. And it's important that you um, you have some sort of risk management around your suppliers and that they can uh, demonstrate to you as a as a um, someone procuring those services that they understand the the risk for cyber security and that they uh, they themselves are also cyber secure um i guess the the probably the largest challenge really is around the iot centric systems and making sure that you're procuring systems that are uh, secure by design so they have they they have been um designed with security in mind, um, and so that you've got some comfort that at least you've got systems that, that um, can be patched if there are vulnerabilities found, et cetera. Another key challenge is the training and awareness of um, sort of cybersecurity vulnerabilities 
and the impact of how um, users can um, affect the security posture of a smart building. If you think about all of those building systems that are all interconnected, um, potentially uh, uh, someone doing something on one system, a vulnerability that could be exploited on one system could impact other building systems. And I think the one of the other key um, key things that we're we're sort of starting to see now, people sort of thinking about discussing, and, and James already touched on this, is the the amount of data these systems create, and how do we secure the data, and how do we demonstrate to our tenants that are potentially moving into our our multi-tenanty smart buildings that we're serious about security, that we're securing that data, and that we're not. Um, we're not um, allowing um, personally identifiable um, viable information to be um, potentially uh, insecured um, and maybe you know where we're using sort of cloud-based solutions, um, allowing that type of information to be um, disclosed to other third parties. So if we look at the IoT systems, um, Typically, you could split those into sort of three three layers of devices. So we have the um, the field devices, which would be potentially your sensors, could be your um, could be your cameras, could be devices to do with your vertical transportation or your lift systems. And then above that, the layer that the the automation layer is typically your controllers and the, the, the sort of brains of the, the systems that those devices communicate with. Um, and then above that, you then have your management level. And that management level could potentially be a cloud-based solution. It could also be servers and workstations that are used within that building environment. But each one of those layers each have their own um, different types of vulnerability that need to be um, need need some sort of security controls and they need to be addressed in some way. The other thing to think about here with smart with smart building is that convergence of the systems. So where you have different systems by different manufacturers um, communicating with each other and sharing data in so you know in the benefit of um, making the building smart. Um, but a vulnerability on one system, one device, one sensor, for example, if that was exploited, could affect other building systems. And the other thing also to think about is that these systems where we're now using, we're seeing more convergence and using single networks within a building, um, your building systems could also affect um, your management system, so where you're using emails and your own storage requirements for a building as part of the management of the building, um, because they're, they're now all sort of interrelated, interconnected, um, they can all potentially be vulnerable and used as a, as a means of attacking the building. And the other thing with the, what, what we're starting to find is that different manufacturers, different suppliers are providing systems into buildings, but we're ending up with disparate workstations and servers provided by different people, the different manufacturers, whether they're Dell, HP, or black box solutions, as I call it. And um, things that tend to be missed is um, patch management strategies. So how are we going to ensure that all of those devices, all of those uh, computer devices, uh, remain up to date with patches, so the operating systems or, or, or any software that's related to the, the system it's managing, and also anti-malware. Um, how do we ensure that all of those devices, all those computers and et cetera, all have anti-malware solutions? And um, it's not uncommon to have um, a workstation stuck in a corner somewhere that no one's touched for many years, that's got Windows XP on it, and uh, maybe a supplier has access to it through VPN. Um, that that also sits on the network, that sits on that, that converged network. I think the other thing also to consider, as we're now seeing with smart buildings, is the requirement for um, bring your own device. So where a tenant can use their own mobile phone, they can load a building app, and they can then control their heating and ventilation system, or they can pre-book their visitors, um, or they can, they've got mobile credentials, so they don't need to use a card to get into a building and they use their mobile phone. 
So again, it adds another level of complexity and it just increases the attack surface of that building. So we've touched on this supply chain. It is complex. It's a, it's a, it's a complex um, cybersecurity vulnerability for a smart building. Um, and it, it is important that your, um, your suppliers have been vetted and can demonstrate that they, they are cyber aware or cyber security aware and uh, they're not going to create any um, further vulnerability to, the, to your building. And in essence, um, what you need is you need all of your suppliers, the supply chain need to work together cohesively to, to help ensure that that building or your building remains secure. So um, in terms of property managers, um, it's, it's important that, that you have some sort of maturity level in terms of cyber security and, and, a, and a, a, a target maturity level where you want to get to. You have implemented some security governance, so you're managing security. You have, um, whether that's using a, a, some sort of cybersecurity framework, but security governance is an important um, overall um, arching um, means of managing security within your, your smart building. There's also then the risk management side and um, identifying where you have gaps uh, that, that potentially are, are stopping you from moving into a more mature, more secure um, level of building. And then again, we, we spoke about chain, uh, chain uh, supply chain, but again, it's carrying out due diligence and ensuring that your suppliers are secure and are not um, creating any vulnerabilities to your building. And then there's the ongoing maintenance of the system, whether that's patching of IoT devices, updating servers, workstations, making sure that you have strategies for backing up systems and means of, of managing incidents, et cetera. So the, the challenges facility and management companies have is slightly different. Um, and as I touched on earlier, um, potentially a facility management company takes on a building Perhaps they have no involvement in, in the building systems that are in there, which is probably quite common. So there's, um, there is certainly a process of kind of understanding what, seals, what systems they have in the building. Quite often the facility management company are responsible for security, so it is important they do understand what systems they have, potentially the vulnerabilities they have, and, um, and then how, how they can then sort of manage that for the building owner. Um, and so again, there is a we, and the, these are these are guidance that we that we've provided within our in our documents. So um, we do explain how you can identify building systems, etc. Um, but really, the process um, for the facility and management companies is really around sort of gathering the information. Um, assessing their position and understanding where they want to reach, what sort of security provision and maturity they want to try and aim for, and then planning how they can then improve the security posture. And obviously that's going to involve um, probably a lot of assistance from supply chain. So that will be your, your installers and maintainers of your building systems and, and potentially in-house um, in house IT as well. And then implementing those changes and then reviewing those on a regular basis to ensure that you remain secure and hopefully your security posture improves over time. Um, and so the uh, the facility and management guidance document really talks around the, the whole sort of life cycle of the building from um, really sort of looking at the security of those devices, improving the security posture, risk management, and um, and then through to sort of running, upgrading to building systems, and then at the end of their of the building systems life cycle, how to dispose of those systems um, in a in the correct fashion. Um, over to James. Oh, thank you very much, Jason. That's uh, really really useful. Uh, outline of what we've been doing on those two documents and uh, I mean importance of risk management obviously is, is vital it's establishing a risk profile 
in your organization, which includes now uh, risks to IoT and uh, how are you going to manage those. And as uh, ASIS International does actually explain, you should have an enterprise security risk management approach, which means that you work across the organization looking at all your risks. So that, that is what we're trying to do there as well in our documents, is to encourage this collaboration between all areas of security risk and also involving all other stakeholders who will be impacted by those security risks, which is most of the people in the, in the building now when you bring in privacy as well. It's everybody. So... Um, in addition to this, the manufacturers are often targeted as the people that are responsible for everything that's going wrong with the device and the system where they made it, and they're, all the vulnerabilities and the flaws are in there. Is it not their fault? Can't they fix it? And part of our uh, remit is to try and help manufacturers see their responsibility in making the product and the device secure. So that's what the foundation's about. And so, so we've written a lot already about this, but uh, the guide that we're looking at, um, we've got a couple more minutes to briefly oversee that uh, we've written quite a bit about what the manufacturers should be looking at themselves. So um, we probably can't cover all of it right now. It's quite detailed and it's quite uh, helpful. And there are a few levels to look at, starting um, with the environment and then the architecture, the risk profiling, as I talked about, the security requirements, threat modeling, hardware design, firmware design, security testing. Um, those in themselves are big topics but they also apply to manufacturers of products in, in smart buildings. Uh, you know, next slide, is it part of a cloud-based solution? Well, often it is now. Is What are the potential failure modes? Fail-safe, that's a big issue that we've that has been identified. You know, does it fail-safe? That applies just as much to IoT devices as it does to devices that are not connected to the Internet. Next slide short talks about risk profiling and assessment. Uh, could that product be a stepping stone, as, as Jason looked at, to a larger system? So could by getting into your your heating system, could that get give the attacker access to a corporate email, eventually the chief executive? It sounds scary, but could they raise an invoice through it? And it's been done. And that's the trouble. Um, people are not looking at these sort of low-level risks. You know, they think, oh, that's only a building management system. They don't care about it. So the, the, the important thing now is that all of us in this field begin to see that we need to, as Jason was talking about, design things properly from the beginning and then test them when they're in the building. Um, the next slide talks about security requirements. And for those who've got a lot of knowledge on this area, there is a very good uh, standard called ISA 62443, which of course looks at all these issues um, and takes a very comprehensive approach to looking at the vulnerabilities of these um, particular kinds of products and then um, makes requirements on them. Next slide looks at threat modeling. Again, if you're going to do any kind of risk assessment, you need to uh, understand what the threats are to the to your environment. And there's there are many of these, as we've alluded to. And that threat modelling is 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 key to to understanding your your uh, risk profile. Then hardware design, of course. You know what what's this slide talks about? What's the expected life ex of the product because it could be five years old now but in 10 years time it's still being used in the building and it's more of a problem then because it can't be patched talking about patching it, it, it just can't be anymore because the company might not even exist so that you can't go to them and say oh my device doesn't work i really like to use it on my on my door but you know they've gone out of business 
and then you're stuck because it doesn't work or it fail, doesn't fail safe or whatever is the problem. Then the next slide just talks about firmware design. So within the, the device, the firmware is is it's not um, being properly uh, the code's not well very well developed in the first place, and is it even being reviewed? Um, and to, to, to does you know do you know what it actually can do? That's the other thing about these devices. What what is it capable of doing? Do you know? Have you checked with the manufacturer and asked them all the different things it can do? Because some things can do things that you don't know about, and that's why you should be concerned because it's not just monitoring the, you know, the people coming in the building. It can also send information about those people to someone else who would be just as interested, but you don't know that's what's going on. And then the last one is on, not least, security testing. So there are lots of issues where these things, these things need to be tested in the design and also when they're being installed and commissioned. And that way you might be, have some confidence that they, they're not you know, used, being used by someone else that you don't know about. And it sounds scary as we said <laughs> before, but we need to lock these things down. You know? And it can be done if you get somebody who's a professional pen tester and Crest, for example, is someone you can turn to, but they can recommend pen testers, and you should be using those if you're deploying these. As, as we found out, that you may have them for CCTV, possibly, but you might not have it for a heating system. Is that being tested? Is all the software that's govern, governing that being pen tested so that it, it doesn't have too many bugs in? And if it does have them, what's being done about it? Um, and then our last slide is um, if you'd like to get involved and, and ask for some help or join a forum that we're trying to set up with uh, Building Week here, the whole, one of the main issues that we're, we're here for is to, to launch a cybersecurity construction cybersecurity forum. And we'd like to hear from people on the call if they'd, they'd be interested in joining that and what they'd be interested in doing and how they could help. Thank you so much. That was. Uh, um, I, I'm just interjecting there. Are you on your last slide there? I think. Yes. Wonderful. Um, so I'm just going to re repeat that to um, to the audience. Obviously, you know, the, a, a main driver uh, behind this webinar is to, to get mm -hmm. constructions involvement. Um, is it fair to say, um, James and Jason, that um, the construction sector is seen as a bit of a laggard in terms of the cyber security space are there sectors that are doing it well are there parts of construction that are doing it well yes i, I think there are that the, 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 let's say so the building information management area bim and there's quite a lot being done and has been done over a few years now uh, so there's there's quite a lot going on in that area and one of our members um She's uh, a leader in that field, so we have experience in that in that field. And of course, there will be people who are in facilities, uh, big companies who are doing cybersecurity already. But it's not necessarily everyone doing this. And you it could be could be argued that you're right; it's a bit of a lag. But there will be people who are doing it really well. And they've got some fantastic smart buildings that are, you know, state of the art with cybersecurity as well, and, and we commend them for that. But that's not everybody, I don't think, to be fair. I, and I think just picking up on something, um, I can't remember if it was James or Jason said this, but someone mentioned that that one of the problems is that um, facilities, some facilities management professionals may not have relationships with. You know, good working relationships with cybersecurity professionals. Yeah, unfortunately, actually, be that breakdown in communication, or or just that communication has never been established. Is is that part of the problem? I think that's part of the problem. It, it's not necessarily established uh, with. It might be with IT, but not necessarily with with the cybersecurity team. If there is one, they're not looking at these issues. And this, well, this is what I've addressed is to to encourage this collaboration between them. Um, and property managers as well, obviously. I think the other the other consideration or the other difficulty sometimes is knowing where to go to find help. 
Mm. And um, I mean, we, it, the, the thing with a smart building and the cybersecurity risks, it's very, it's very unique. And, and potentially your average information security professional may not necessarily un, understand the, the vulnerabilities and risks associated with these sort of IoT centric systems. Um, mm. So I think unless, uh, so we do hope that within the guidance documents that we produce, that there is, um, it does kind of point you in a direction where you can potentially find people that can help you um, securing your building. So whether that's at the design stage, which is obviously the best time to think about cybersecurity or any security, um, but also um, if the building's already in use, and, um, and, and as I sort of touched upon really with the facility management side, quite often you're given a building to manage. You've had no control over the systems that are in there. That's all been, that's all been done part of the sort of construction phase. And then you're faced with the, the responsibility of ensuring that your building's secure. So where do you go? Where do you get help? Um, and hopefully we have provided some guidance within our documents there. And, and just on that and while point, you're waiting, the National Cybersecurity Centre have produced this Connected Places. It's a 16-page document which really does cover a lot of the same things that we're talking about. And so gives, so that's a good reference um, to use if, if you are interested and want to know more about what the principles are. Because within that document, they also refer to cloud security and all other things which they have written comprehensively on. And so they're drawing attention to this this field as well. So, so it seems what you're saying is that there's there's an onus on everyone who's who's working in on buildings basically to mm. to increase your awareness. But also, are 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 you saying that you you need to know what you don't know in the sense of you need to be yeah. connected to experts? Um, and are there I don't know, but are there enough? Of these experts is this a bit of a call to the industry to to get more people interested in specializing in cyber security and, and smart buildings well yes there aren't there aren't enough no definitely um let's say with cyber security generally there aren't enough people to, to do the job but then it uh, the, the iot side of things is 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 not so seen as a, such a high prior priority <laughs> As the other other hacks and attacks that, that companies face, but the, it's a, we had a, at our conference, we had a very well known hacker come on and give a talk, and he said, "Well, you know, so what are we going to do as attackers?" He, in, he's a friendly hacker, and they, he said, "Because obviously buildings are, are a, a prime target because they're they're not being secured, whereas other th other areas of the business are have got more cybersecurity professionals, if any." working with them on it this one is the easy target and that, that's that you know that's the case unfortunately we're well, fortunate you could say for people in our field but yeah and I, I was really struck by um something you said about you know um something as simple as uh security cameras you know yeah. you think most buildings having security cameras and you don't necessarily think that they're going to be smart buildings and i i just know this from personal or not not that I know the cause of it, but that um, I know uh, of schools that have had to be shut down because they've been hacked. Now, you, yeah. you're never told yeah. how that school was hacked, but you do wonder, <laughs> um, you know, when you're talking yeah. about high risk, if we're, you know, and the people in the buildings are the ones that are going to be affected. You know, we yeah. really can't afford for children to lose out more education because that, you know, schools don't have the money to pay a, a ransomware demand. No. I mean, we, which we should have said at the beginning more, so, although we talk about smart buildings, <coughs> we're also, um, the premise really is it's buildings with these devices and systems in, so that counts for 95% probably of most buildings have now got some kind of connected uh, CCTV in them, if they're, if they're a big, big enough level, or even schools, as you said. <coughs> so, yes. So, we're, we're, so the guidance is looking at helping that. So not just smart buildings. Yeah, absolutely. Well, actually, oh, sorry, Jason, you come in there. 
Yeah, I was just going to say, just sort of touching on the the um, the, the sort of CCTV access from the internet. <clears throat> and actually, it's not to say the systems are necessarily vulnerable, or they they've got um, uh, you know vulnerabilities within the cameras or the, or the the recording hardware. It could be they're just not configured correctly. And so some mm. of this comes back to supply chain. I mentioned supply chain a few times, but it's ensuring that your your security installers, your building management installers, etc., understand how to secure those systems, so that you're not create or not allowing or or, or um, having up vulnerabilities that actually is not really down to the device. It's just really um, not being configured correctly. So it's not to say that every smart building has loads of vulnerable devices because it's the way it's been manufactured. It's just perhaps how it's been set up and configured. Um, yeah, and I think. That, that seems to um, point to the, the complexity of the of the problem. It's that there are so many variables when you're talking about the technology. Um, but actually, I'm, I'm just going to come to one of our um, listeners' questions, which I, I think um, kind of moves on from this. So we were talking about, you know, what are smart buildings? Um, and they don't necessarily have to be what, what you consider um, super, super tech. But um, uh, John has just written in to say, um, how does the panel um, see the future of residential technology, such as smart door locks and doorbells becoming the norm? Or will incidents revert residents to stick to tried and tested manual hardware of just ringing a doorbell or knocking on a door? Um, have we all got a bit carried away and are we making ourselves vulnerable? Yes. I think from, you see the from case of the doctor, she's got, she's got, she might get £100,000 because... Uh, her neighbour's got a, a, a ring, you know, one of these ring cameras that can see, well, basically hear and see her within 20 metres. So she protested to the court and, what, and she may be getting compensation. Oh, wow. So that's, sorry, I don't know about that case. Is that a UK case? Yes, it's just the other day, it was this woman doctor, she, her neighbour has got a ring doorbell with a webcam, on, with a camera on it, so they can hit. So he can check for deliveries and talk to delivery drivers from somewhere else. And that's why he's got it. But she's actually complaining because it can see her and hear what she's saying within 20 metres. Right, so there's and a she... privacy issue there. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. The, the thing <laughs> about technology, though, um, I, I just don't think it's not ever going to go away and and we certainly I've found on some of the residential schemes I've worked on recently the owner so those that are building the schemes are saying well actually we want to enable um, people to use their mobile phone to get get into their apartment um, mm. whereas previously yes it would be a key but it's I think it's catering for for the younger generation that are probably a bit more um, technology centric than perhaps I'm not a technologist, but um, you know, I think our children, my children, have grown up with technology. Whereas for me, I've I've sort of embraced technology through my career, um, and I just think I think I don't think the interconnected and smart type building systems, etc., are ever going to go away. I think it it's a it's certainly a problem that's going to stay, and that we it, we it needs addressing. I mean, we just have to address you know cybersecurity with with our built environment. Yeah, yeah, it's an ongoing issue and there's some tension there, maybe generational tensions as well. Um, so I'm, I'm going to move on to Emma's question, which is um, most, cyber, most cyber insurance policies incorporate instant response services. Has there been any engagement with providers of cyber insurance to ensure that the services can be deployed uh, to respond to the unique challenges inherent in smart building management systems? Sorry, that's quite a long question, but <laughs> do either uh, James or Jason want to comment back on that? <laughs> Around insurance, I, I think, do, does the insurance market, um, is, it, is, is it actually uh, reflecting what people need? Well, there is, uh, there is some, quite a lot of work being done for the last three or four years on cyber security insurance, and this now includes IoT, um, and I think it's fair to say because the, the companies like, well, even cities are taking out insurance so they can pay in order to pay out ransomware attacks. I know it's not quite answering Emma's question, but on a, low, on a higher level, 
they certainly are taking out insurance to, in order to pay uh, for losses that they're going to experience, and they are being covered for it. And so there are more people taking out cyber insurance and more companies offering cyber insurance. And uh, it's just a question of um, whether you choose to, to pay out. I mean, it's certainly... Um, I mean, it's a, a quite a famous uh, cryptographer said a few years ago that the GDPR, which is the data protection uh, legislation, would be the thing that drives, really drives security and um, protection of these systems. So the people can be landed with big fines of, and failing to comply with that. And if your system is seen as not being protected, not secure, and it's going to be a, there's going to be then it's not providing the privacy because the, the security controls aren't working properly. So your privacy isn't um, maintained. And then you can, so you can, let, if you see where I'm coming from with this, you can go accuse the, the manufacturer of failing um, to secure the data, as Jason and I were talking about earlier. That's going to be the most effective way. And there, there is actually IoT. And actually, the U.S. have got an IoT um, Improvement Act, which they are saying for federal, that's the government uh, organizations in the U.S., do have to um, take action now when they make a, 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 a procurement decision. Have they looked at these issues that we've just been discussing earlier? It doesn't apply, apply to commercial property, or, you know, um, but it does apply to the federal government because the U.S. is more concerned than, than we are, so. I suppose well, yeah. the NCSC is concerned, so I should, I should add. <laughs> but they've got so a law on it. What you're saying there, James, is that while while there is the insurance market and they are picking up the claims, that we're that's sort of coming at it from the from the point of view of once once the damage is done and, and actually probably what we need is a bit more um, of some form of regulation or obligation to um, ensure that your cybersecurity is fit for purpose. So we've got it for the consumer product, and we're hoping that our government brings in more on the commercial side of things. Um, and it's probably coming. I said, as I said, uh, the, I, the US have got an IoT Security Improvement Act, but it's only enforced for the government for the government buildings. But we don't have that here yet. Is there, are there any moves to, to legislate? There, there are apparently moves for that. Um, but we're not sure. Um, we're obviously uh, involved participating and helping, guiding um, as a foundation are involved in supporting that. We haven't, it hasn't actually come into pass yet, but it has, it has for consumer products. So. Okay. Well, I think the other thing, sorry. just very, very quickly, I know we're, we're almost out of time here, um, but there is a, there's a certification scheme now, Smart Score, which is run by Wired Score, and it's, um, it's really a measurement of how smart your building is. Um, and actually, an element of that is having a cybersecurity policy and a user data policy. So it, it's actually quite refreshing to see a certification scheme that has at least some focus on security and it's mandatory for certain certain levels of um, award i think gold golden platinum for example um so i think that's good that's i mean it's obviously it's voluntary but if you if you want your building to be a gold or, or platinum certified um in terms of smartness you'll need cyber security so uh, or at least some sort of um cyber security strategy Okay, well, look, um, Jason and James, that's probably a good note to end on, that um, there's no point waiting for government legislation. You might as well find out what's out there, find out what guidance is there. And obviously, you've been pointed during this webinar to um, lots of um, information and publications that are available to you. Um, and, you know, there seems to be um, a, a real need to collaborate more, to get involved, to talk to other professionals, in this area and to, to raise awareness of the risks because they are substantial um, and concerning uh, whatever type of um, building you're, we're talking about. Mm. So we've just discussed that smart doesn't need to be the latest thing. In fact, it, it can be a, a, the combination of technology in the building and all of the people in the building could be affected. So I don't think the risks get much higher than that. 
Um, so um, I'll end it there with um, my thanks to James and uh, Jason and also to, um, to, to you for putting the uh, presentation together. And um, are there any final words? I, I think we've got the last slide is just there to get in touch. So I think um, both James and Jason would encourage you to do that. Um, and I think we will finish it there. So thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you, thank you very much. Thanks.